Why would a nuclear war start? The lingering fear the war in Ukraine could evolve into a nuclear conflict. What would trigger the unimaginable decision to launch such devastating weapons? It doesn't appear that North Korea wants to slow down its nuclear weapons program. It appears that they want to make more nuclear weapons and they want to make those weapons more deadly. How would the US respond in a world forever changed by the threat of nuclear destruction. For this military coalition, it's also intended to send a clear message to its would-be adversaries. Mess with us at your peril. The United States currently possesses around 5,550 nuclear warheads. This figure includes both deployed and non-deployed warheads, meaning those actively ready for launch and those kept in reserve. The US nuclear arsenal is vast, making it one of the most powerful in the world. Among these warheads, the B-83, a gravity bomb designed to penetrate hardened underground facilities, is one of the most powerful in the US arsenal. Although estimates vary, there are thought to be around 650 of these bombs still in existence. The US also maintains two main types of missiles capable of delivering nuclear payloads, the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missiles and the Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles. These systems form critical parts of the US nuclear defense strategy. The United States nuclear deterrence strategy is built on the nuclear triad to ensure survivability and the ability to respond to a nuclear attack. The three legs of this triad are land-based ICBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers. This structure ensures that the US maintains the capability to retaliate, even if one or two components are compromised. The US has 400 operational ICBMs deployed in silos across several states like Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. These silos hold Minuteman III missiles, each capable of carrying multiple warheads. These missiles can be launched within minutes of a presidential order and are considered the backbone of the land-based leg of the triad. Interestingly, there are also 50 additional silos that serve as decoys, meaning they do not contain any missiles. Each Minuteman III ICBM has a range of over 13,000 kilometers or just over 8,000 miles and can carry up to 475 kilotons of explosive firepower. The second leg of the triad is the US fleet of 14 Ohio-class strategic submarines. These submarines are armed with Trident II ballistic missiles and are a critical component of the nuclear deterrent because of their stealth and mobility. Eight of these submarines are stationed at Bangor near Seattle in Washington, while six are ported in Kings Bay in Georgia near Jacksonville, Florida. Each Ohio-class submarine is powered by a nuclear reactor that can operate for up to 15 years without the need for refueling. This allows the submarines to patrol the world's oceans for extended periods of time, typically around 77 to 90 days before needing to return to port for maintenance. Each submarine carries up to 20 Trident II missiles with a range of approximately 12,000 kilometers or close to 7,500 miles. What makes these missiles so deadly is their incredible accuracy capable of hitting targets within 100 meters, even from such a great distance. Each submarine has enough firepower to destroy an entire country, making them a cornerstone of the US second strike capability. The final leg of the triad consists of strategic bombers and air-delivered nuclear weapons. The US military stores hundreds of nuclear bombs, including the B-83 at various military bases, both domestically and abroad. These bombs can be delivered by aircraft such as the B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber or the B-52 Stratofortress. The nuclear triad forms a system of deterrence that ensures the US can respond to any nuclear threat. This approach ensures that even in the face of a first strike, the US retains the ability to respond with overwhelming force, making the prospect of nuclear war a devastating and likely suicidal choice for any potential adversary. However, Let's imagine a scenario where a rogue leader, for whatever reason, has ordered a nuclear strike against the United States. As terrifying as this sounds, there are strict and well-established protocols in place to determine the immediate actions that will unfold. 
the launch of an ICBM follows three distinct phases. First is the boost phase, where the rocket is launched into space. During this phase, the missile uses its engines to gain speed and altitude, burning bright and hot. The US relies on the space-based infrared system to detect missile launches. This advanced satellite system is capable of identifying the infrared exhaust plume of a missile almost instantly after launch. To confirm the data from the satellite, ground-based radar systems such as the ground-based mid-course defense work alongside it. These systems verify the satellite's information, ensuring that both space and ground-based data confirm the strike, improving accuracy and reducing false alarms. The second phase is the mid-course phase, where the missile reaches its peak in space and travels at incredible speeds, up to Mach 20, around 24,000 kilometers per hour or 15,000 miles per hour. At this point, the missile can travel vast distances across the globe. However, this is also the final opportunity for defensive systems such as missile interceptors to potentially target and destroy it before it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. Finally, in the terminal phase, the nuclear warhead re-enters the atmosphere, heading toward its target at blistering speeds. Once it gets this far, the chances of interception become minimal and the impact is almost certain. In such a scenario, the US president has a narrow window of time, about 10 to 15 minutes, to make a decision regarding a retaliatory strike that will potentially seal the fate of humanity. The president's decision for the release of nuclear weapons is governed by the two-man rule at all times. If the president decides that the United States must launch nuclear weapons, the decision is communicated to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and through him to the National Military Command Center, which is often called the War Room via the Presidential Emergency Satchel, better known as the Football. Inside the Football, there is a black book listing a menu of strike options and the Biscuit, a 3x5-inch card with authentication codes for the president to confirm his identity. The menu of strike options includes major attack options, selected attack options, and limited attack options. At the first sign of an incoming nuclear strike, the president would be evacuated aboard the E-4B Nightwatch, commonly known as the Doomsday Plane. This aircraft is designed to operate in the midst of a nuclear war, flying high above the country to serve as a secure command center. It is specifically equipped to resist electromagnetic pulses or EMPs, ensuring continuous communication and control. However, if the president were incapacitated during the attack, the chain of command would immediately pass to the vice president or another designated leader, ensuring that a retaliatory strike can still be ordered. The Pentagon has conducted numerous simulations of potential nuclear conflicts, and the results are almost always the same. Nuclear Armageddon. One simulation, developed by Princeton's Science and Global Security Project, estimated that a full-scale nuclear war between the US and Russia would result in over 90 million deaths and injuries within the first few hours of conflict. The long-term effects, such as radiation and nuclear fallout, would cause hundreds of millions of deaths over time. The concern is with leaders who may not be deterred by the concept of mutually assured destruction or MAD. Such leaders could escalate tensions to the point of a nuclear exchange, despite knowing it could devastate civilization. The simulations confirm that nuclear war, even a limited one, would likely trigger widespread destruction, fundamentally altering life itself on our planet. While it's very difficult to predict the exact response of the US during nuclear war, a very sensitive document got declassified in 2012 that showed the exact nuclear war plans of the US during the 1960s. This was known as the Single Integrated Operational Plan, or PSYOP, which was the United States general plan for nuclear war from 1961 to 2003. The PSYOP was primarily directed against targets in the Soviet Union and later Russia, but it also included targets in China, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, Syria and Libya. 
The first PSYOP, titled PSYOP 62, was finished on December 14, 1960 and implemented in July 1, 1961. It described a war plan with the entire US arsenal to launch all 3,200 of its nuclear warheads in a massive strike against the Soviet Union, China, and their allies. The total explosive power of these warheads was nearly 8,000 megatons of TNT. To put that in perspective, that's the same as dropping over half a million Hiroshima bombs. If one Hiroshima bomb caused unimaginable devastation, think about the impact of more than 500,000 of them spread across the Soviet Union and China. This was the US nuclear strategy to eliminate the communist threat once and for all. The execution of PSYOP-62 was estimated to result in 285 million dead and 40 million casualties in the Soviet Union and China. The first PSYOP, based on the Massive Retaliation Doctrine, had little flexibility, treating all communist countries as a uniform bloc. PSYOP-62 included the virtual obliteration of the tiny country of Albania because within its borders sat a huge Soviet air defense radar which had to be taken out with high assurance. When Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara raised concern about this, Strategic Air Commander Thomas Power smiled at him and said, Well, Mr. Secretary, I hope you don't have any friends or relations in Albania because we are just going to have to wipe it out. During 1961 to 1962, the Kennedy administration revised this plan as supervised by McNamara. He aimed to change the doctrine from massive retaliation to flexible response. PSYOP 63 took effect in July 1962 and remained mostly unchanged for more than 10 years. Instead of one spasm attack, it proposed five escalating attack options, Soviet nuclear missile sites like bomber airfields and submarine tenders, other military sites away from cities such as air defenses, military sites near cities, command and control centers, and then a so-called full-scale spasm attack. We have lived in the shadow of nuclear weapons for decades, and the world has come too close too many times. In today's nuclear age, the final hour of humanity could be only one miscalculation away.